Genesis chapter 20, verses 1 through 13. Now Abraham moved on from there into the region of Negev and lived between Kadesh and Shur. For a while he stayed in Gerar. And there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. But God came to Abimelech in a dream one night and said to him, you are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is a married woman. Now Abimelech had not gone near her, so he said, Lord, will you destroy an innocent nation? Did not he say to me, she is my sister? And didn't she also say, he is my brother? I have done this with a clear conscience and clean hands. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know you did this with a clear conscience, and so I have kept you from sinning against me. That is why I did not let you touch her. Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, you may be sure that you and all who belong to you will die. Early the next morning, Abimelech summoned all his officials, and when he told them all what had happened, they were very much afraid. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such guilt upon me and my kingdom? You have done things to me that should never be done. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What was your reason for doing this? Abraham replied, I said to myself, There is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, she is really my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother, and she became my wife. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to me. Everywhere we go, Say of me, he is my brother. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Good morning and welcome again to Redeemer in Lincoln Square. I know we just did the peace of Christ. I always love that. Greet each other, you know, images of God. Greet each other. Okay, now stop. <laughs> you know, stop greeting. Um, we Obviously, our liturgy, we do it every week because we believe innately how important you all are um, for you to be able to be known and loved, and then also to know and love other folks and invite them and bring them here. Um, I love that about our church. Our church is also going through a series looking at the book of Genesis to particularly look at work. And we're doing that because the average New Yorker spends 2,200 hours, average, a lot of some of you more, some of you less, 2,200 hours at work. That's a lot of time. And if you take our definition of work, which what we've been saying here, Work is anything not rest, and so that means work isn't just your vocation, it's what you do at home, what you do with your friends, what you do with family members. That's even more hours, and yet most of us have not done the, the deep thinking, the deep work, the deep dive into knowing why are we called to this, how are we called to this, what does it actually look like to work to heal and fix other images of God and creation itself. And why are we meant to do that? For Abraham, who we've been looking at, in Genesis 12, he's called away from his family, all that he knows, and he's called two people who don't necessarily love him, who don't understand him, and he's called to be a blessing to them. And what we read here in chapter 20, right here, he messes up. He doesn't do it. Even though he had the promises of God, even though he had the blessings of God, and Christians... Believers are in the same boat. Believers know that they have God's love. Believers know that they have God's salvation. We have have those promises, and yet we still don't go out in blessing. We still don't think 
in those terms. We still don't do it. And so what I want to do today is look at why. Why does that happen? And we're going to do it in, in three different ways. We're, we're going to look at first the poison, then the placebos, and then the antidote. The poison, the placebos. I know I didn't do alliteration. I, I could have done a, the third one be a P, but I didn't do it. So it's poison, placebos, and then antidote. So number one, the poison. What's poisonous here in this text that we just read? Some of you will say, oh, it's because Abraham, he lied. That's poisonous. And I want to tell you, yes, that there is a poison in our lives, but there is something beneath that lie that leads to the lie. The lie is a symptom to a deeper problem. He actually does this almost exact lie a couple chapters before to Pharaoh. When he goes on to Egypt, he lies to Pharaoh about his sister, and he does it again, and he kind of admits it in verse 13. He says to his wife, this is how you can show your love to me. Wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. That's a systemic lie. He's, he's, he's put it in her mind to do this. Why does he do that? He does it, and we're told why he does it. In verse 11, he tells Abimelech, I did it because I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place. In other words, I was afraid for my life. And that's what's behind and underneath every single one of our lies. It's fear. And, there's, and I want to look at two different types of fear. There's a psychological fear, and there's a theological fear in all fear. First, psychological fear. And that, this is pretty simple. Deep down, the reason why you lie, the reason why you shade, the reason why you spin things is because we feel like we have to. We feel like that, that there's going to be a better outcome if we do that than actually tell the truth. So in the case of Abraham, he did it. Why? Because in the ancient Near East, stealing wives was a thing. And when you, st- steal, when you took somebody else's wife, because of the laws of the land, you often killed the husband so that you could legally do it. And so he was afraid for his life, that if he told the truth, he would die. So he made a calculated decision, psychologically, to lie. And he rationalizes it, too. Look in verse 12. He says these phrases, besides, oh, we all kind of know. Well, she, she really is my sister, technically speaking. And technically speaking, he, he ex- explains, she, he was, she, sorry, she was his sister. He just conveniently leads out the other side of things, which is that he's also, that she's also his wife to Abimelech. And we do the same thing. I'll give you some examples. Social media filters. When you use those social media filters, what's happening? Technically, it's you, but it's not. There's a shade that, you know, it's not fully you. Uh, We live in a world of content. In our phones, you can press a button, and you can have every piece of content in front of you. And what we can do then is we can take that content and and, uh, pan it off as our own. And you you can come up with technicalities of why you get to use that stuff. But then, underneath it all, you, you spin the origins of where it came from. Or how about this? We live in a world where people say, how are you doing all the time, right? How are you doing? How are you doing? And you know what we say? We, in our minds, we, this is what happens. We go, well, I'm actually not doing well at all, and I'm really upset, and if I tell you I'm afraid I'm going to start talking too much and then start crying, I can't get out of this downward spiral, and then you might reject me. I don't want to actually do that. And so what I say is, fine. I'm fine. Technically, you are, but it's actually not. It's, there's a spin there. There's a move that's happening in that moment. Because we're shading, because it's easier and cleaner and safer. And so Abraham, all Abraham wanted to do, he wanted to be safe. And so he does this. And he does it to Pharaoh. And he does it to Abimelech. And notice, this is what I want you to see. Notice that that is part of who we are. That, and it happens in so many different places. In text messages, there was a study done that the majority of our text messages have these little shades that they're not fully 100% accurate. When you, go, when you actually don't reply right away, there's a little lie going on in that moment because you just don't want to have to deal with it right then. Do, do, are people made in God's image and they deserve the honor and respect? Don't you want to be replied to? When you, and you, we do the same thing back to each other. No wonder there's so much distrust, psychological fear. Now, there's also a theological reason behind lying too. Notice the Bible says in verse 9, what have you done to us? And if you go to uh, chapter 12, when he does this to Pharaoh, he says something very similar. What have you done to me? Which is very similar to what God says to Adam and Eve in the garden after the first 
sin, the fruit, you know what God says? What have you done? The Genesis writer is trying to connect the dots for us and trying to show us that Adam and Eve, what happened there is happening everywhere. Because what happens with Adam and Eve? When God says, what have you done here? Adam says, well, Eve made me do it. Technically, that's true, but he has agency still. So there's a, there's a spin. What does Eve do? Well, the serpent made me do it. Technically true, but not quite, because there's a spin there of, what, of, of her own agency. And what we're seeing is that all sin is essentially the same one, the first one, on repeat. And it's, it's this. If I obey, if I do this, good won't happen to me. God won't be good. If I tell the truth, my life will be worse. The first sin questioned God's goodness, and now every single one, under all spins, all lies, at some level, we're not trusting God's going to be good in those spaces. That's a theological fear. There's a theological poison that's deep in Abraham. It's deep in us, and it's why we do what we do. It's why we don't go on mission. It's why we don't want to even talk about or think about or even conceive of things that way. This is why I like Genesis 15. Um, we're not going to talk about it in a, in a sermon, but um, as a whole sermon. But Genesis 15, it's, it's like Abraham's life in a microcosm, right? He, he's uh, in fear because he, I mean, he's lying, and we just said lying is fear. And so he says, I have this fear. And God in verse 1 goes, do not be afraid. And so Abraham says, okay, then what can you give me to help me? And God says, here's some more promises. So he gives more promises, more of my goodness. And you know what happens in verse 6 of chapter 15? Abraham believes. And then two verses later, I love this, two verses later, verse 8, how can I know? <laughs> I believe. I don't believe. <laughs> I, I trust. I, I don't trust. This back and forth is the same thing that's going in all of our hearts. Maybe you've never trusted that he's good. But I want you to ask this question. Where might you not be trusting his goodness in your life? Maybe you never have. Maybe you used to, but now you don't anymore. Maybe you trust God with this aspect of your life, but not this one. I'll trust him with my, when I'm in suffering, I'll trust God, but not with my sex life. I'll trust, I'll trust God with my Sunday life. I'm here on Sunday, but not with my Monday life, my Tuesday life, my Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Where might not we be trusting his goodness because of the poison? Now, what do we do? Second thing we find here, are placebos. Placebos are things that we take that we think might fix the poison, but they're not going to. And, and uh, there's two main ones. We try to deaden the pain and suck out the poison. Deaden the pain, suck out the poison. What's deaden the pain? Well, to deaden the pain, when you have poison in you, there is a tendency to say, I need to deaden that, that pain. I need to get rid of it, right? I, um, during cancer treatments, a lot of folks towards the end you just sort of want to deaden the pain because of the poison in you. Uh, I, in South America, people chew on coca leaves to deaden the pain and, 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 and hold down the hunger. When we go out and we basically try to do YOLO, right? You only live once. Um, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we'll die. That whole movement of chasing experiences is a way to deaden the pain. This is why I actually love the Barbie movie. The first 13 minutes of the Barbie movie... Barbie's washing her hair, she's, she's getting ready, she's doing all the clothes, there's all this consumerism and shopping, and everybody's happy, and they're getting ready for the party, and so they go to the party, and they're having fun, and everybody's kind of doing their dance thing, and, and then the, the, the 13 minutes in, the, the camera zooms in on Barbie's face, and she asks one question. She says, does anybody think about dying? And the movie stops, and, and, and no, nobody knows what to do. They're all kind of looking around. Because that's what happens, that when you're, when you're trying to deaden the pain, you're trying to ignore it all, reality breaks in with those questions, and you don't have the answers. You don't have the answers. And as I was reflecting on this, I was actually thinking about my own life, and actually, in a weird way, I kind of became a Christian through this concept, that I was in college, and I was, uh, let's just say, I was distracting myself with a lot of different things, and I came to this realization, I said, wait a second, if I want to kind of leave reality by distraction, I have to make enough money so that I have enough to afford the ability to buy the things that I can leave reality. So I have to live in reality to leave reality because I grew up in this, this is the reason why you should raise your kids in the city. I grew up in this town where what happens if you um, leave reality all the time, 
you, you, all, everything breaks down. You're on the street. You, you, you can't function. So I'm like, okay, but that, that doesn't seem to work then. To live in reality, to make enough money, to leave reality, it doesn't work to deaden the pain. But there's actually another way that we do it. We try to suck out the poison. If you get a snake bite, some of you will say, oh, I know you need to suck out the poison. So you find the snake bite and you put your mouth on it. You, go, mm, you, try, you, try to, you try to, mm, mm, you try, I'm not kissing myself. I'm trying to suck out the poison. Um, you know what's interesting? Studies have been done. That doesn't actually work. Every single time, it doesn't actually work. And what's so interesting is that in our culture, we still have this concept that that's the thing that you're supposed to do. That there's a, a sort of a, a general societal psyche that thinks that when actually... What happens, but with all the activity, this lack of progress, as your heart rate's going up, you're actually put, put, um, pumping the venom, the poison, further into your life. And I think you can do that religiously, too. You can grow up in the church. You can call yourself a Christian. You can think you're a Christian. You can do all this religious activity. You can kind of frame your life and, you, and say, look what I'm doing, God. I'm, 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 I'm being good. I'm not doing what everybody else is doing. I'm dressing a certain way and acting a certain way. And really your motivation underneath all that is that you're trying to earn God's favor. You're trying to do all this activity, which is actually, by the way, I think often why we get mad at God, because at the end of the day, when things don't go the way we want, we're like, that's not fair. Look what I did for you. And, I, and in that moment, what's happening is you weren't loving God for God's sake. You were loving God to get something from God. That's still not trusting that he's good. That's activity to suck out the poison. It's a lot of doing, but the poison's still in you. you can, there's another way to do this, too. You can set conditions for God. Here's what people do, right? Control. Lord, I will trust you. I just need to know how my life's going to go in every single moment. I just need to be able to see it and, and, and know what's coming. Control. Uh, comfort. God, I'll go on mission to be a restorative presence to these people, to help them and care for them. I just uh, need to have my little creature comforts. Don't call me to some place that has crime or it's dirty or there's people who are needy. I, just, I want my comfort. How about uh, approval? Hey, God, listen, I will uh, go on mission. I'll do this. But I just want to know that people will like me. Right? I don't want to be labeled as, as other. I, don't, I just want to know that I'm in. Each of these conditions are set because we're saying I need this as well, okay, I'll have you, God, but I need this control, this comfort, this power, this approval. That's still putting conditions on God. And we have them because we don't think he's good. Now, Abraham is in the same boat. See, a lot of folks think at this point in the sermons, people, the, the pastor's going to get up and say, well, therefore, be like Abraham. I love Abraham. You know why? He, it's so obvious. Read his life. He's a serial liar. He's a manipulator. Like, he, <laughs> hey, Sarah, if you really loved me, everywhere we go, say that. I mean, he's, this is not a good person. He's a coward. He's a, uh, he, he, and when I say serial, he's doing, he's, I mean, he's lying, he's getting away with it, he's doing it over and over and over again. It's very fascinating that you don't see the negative consequences. So some people go, well, okay, well, maybe there's other figures in the Bible I, I should go to. How about Jacob, Abraham's grandson? Well, Jacob was a serial liar like his grandfather stole his brother's birthright and then tried to bribe him when he got angry at him. Oh, well, you know, Moses, right? Moses led God's people. Yeah, he's out in the wilderness leading God's people, and then he has a tantrum, throws down the staff, starts breaking the rock because he's so upset, and it's, it's so bad he doesn't even get to go to the promised land. See, this is why you should read your Bible, because what you will find is the heroes of the Bible, the biggest problem Christians and non-Christians have is they come to the Bible and they say, okay, i got to find the examples. Be like these guys, these men and women. And yet over and over and over again, which the Bible, which you'll find is the Bible is filled not with good people just doing good things. It's, it's, it's people doing bad things. Why is that? Because the Bible's building an argument for you. And here's how the argument goes. It's there are good people, but they're not good enough. So it's not be like Abraham. The Bible is not saying there are those who fail and those who don't, so be like the ones who don't fail. No, the Bible is saying the only, the only differentiation is those who realize their failures and those who don't realize their failures. 
those who realize they're inconsistent and those who don't realize that they're actually inconsistent. And the sooner that we see that, the sooner we'll stop looking to these various placebos of deadening the pain and sucking out the poison. And so I, before we move on, which one's your favorite cocktail to, to take? Which one is the, one is the pill that you try to, to use day in and day out? Maybe both, maybe some, maybe the others. There's, there's versions of these too. All right, last point then. What's the solution? What's the true antidote? In high school, I ran track, and I ran the 800 meter, which I think is the hardest one because it's not short, it's not long, it's just perfectly awful in the middle. And uh, it's two laps around the track. And I, in my senior year, I was never really good at it, but in senior year, I actually, in the individual track meets with other schools, I was undefeated. And there was this girl I liked, and I wanted her to notice me. And so around the first lap, I look up to the stands, and she's just talking to her friends, and she didn't, could care less. And it hurt. I finished, I, you know, I won my, my race, but the applause I was hearing wasn't the applause that I wanted to hear. Every single one of us has an applause that we want to, want to hear. It could be job, it could be family, it could be friends, it could be money, it could be stuff. I don't know what it is for you. Abraham was looking for an applause, by the way. Look at verse 13. When he says, God made me wander from my father's household, I hope you hear the bitterness there. He's explaining, by the way, he's on excuse-making tracks to Abimelech. Hey, why did I lie? Well, God, <laughs> he made me wander from my father's household. The, the relationships I wanted from the people that I wanted approval and, and comfort from. You can, you, that's, that's, what, that's the applause that he wanted. The Hebrew is actually even more revealing. I, I didn't know this until this week, but the word for God in Hebrew, it's actually in the plural. So the little translation here is, the gods caused me to wander. And that's really interesting. There's, there's a bitterness there where he's, Abraham's losing his faith potentially, or at the very least, he's not talking to Abimelech in the way he should. He's kind of talking as one pagan to the other. Either way, his faith is failing. Instead of witnessing and talking to Abimelech about how God's been faithful to him over 25 years, how he's done terrible things, and yet God's still giving him goodness, he talks as if he doesn't have faith. And so here's the question <laughs> that I want to ask us all. If Abraham had these promises... If he saw smoking fire pots uh, that walked bet between animal pieces to show how much God was committed to him, if he had God's literal conversation in his, in his head and still did this, he still messed up, what hope do we have right now? What hope do we have to be able to, to move out on mission? Well, I think we have something that he did not have. See, he didn't tell the truth. We don't tell the truth because... It will cost us. How will we tell the truth even if it's costly? I, and, I, and I think the only answer is this. You have to somehow get to the place where you knew that in all situations, if you told the truth, ultimately, it wouldn't cost you. Ultimately, you would be safe. And how could we possibly know that? Well, Jesus, when he was on trial... Thousands of years after Abraham, he was on trial in front of Pilate, the one person who had agency over his life to live or die. And he's asked, are you who they say that you are? And he could have easily just spun it. He could have easily said, well, you know, that's who they, they think that, you know, who am I to say? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he's honest. On, when it was his turn on the witness stand, all he had to say was no, but he said yes. And because he does, he dies and we get to live. Instead, he tells the truth. And by dying, he dies for our lies. And you say, okay, well, how does that actually change us? It changes us because you can't tell the truth in all situations unless you trust God that no matter what happens, he's still going to be with you. He's still going to love you. He's still going to stay with you. I promise you that you can't just will yourself to try harder, to, to be honest and be good. There has to be some part of us where every qu human is questioning and wondering, how do I really know God is good? You have to be able to get to the place where you say, I know I'm precious to him because he gave up his life for me. And he was willing to do that.
and he did. When he, in the moment it was his turn to shade, to spin, he doesn't. He stays and dies so that we can live. And what that means for us is we're only going to go out. We're only going to care when we see God being gracious to Abraham and being gracious to us despite our failings. And that's what's going to create a heart of gentleness and love and kindness and goodness. It has to well up. It has to so impact you. From now on, when you're tempted to shade or spin, and you will, by the way, like in an hour, in 10 minutes, later today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, it's going to happen. And there has to be some level of hearing and knowing and experiencing the life-saving, truth-telling of Jesus that his love for you is everything that you ultimately need. And so before we end, I want to ask you this. Have you experienced that kind of love? I was talking to a friend this past week. I'm not talking about feeling. I'm not talking like butterflies. Experience is not just feeling. It's, it's not just head and then emotion. Experience is, is um, tasting and, and knowing. So to end, let me just give you uh, three quick ways that you can know this love. Number one, ask. Uh, my wife showed me a video last night of um, uh, Hollywood actor David Oyelowo's wife, Jessica. They're, they're Christians. I didn't know this. And she was on this video, and she was talking about how for three months she asked God to reveal his love for her. And she did this because she got to this point in her life. <clears throat> she's you know, middle age, and she goes, listen, I have a loving husband. I have loving kids. I have kids that daily say, Mommy, Mommy, I love you. She has like these career achievements, and yet she says, I don't receive, I don't feel that love. I don't understand it. And so she realized the problem wasn't that there wasn't loves out there loving her, it's that she wasn't able to absorb it. And so she said that she needed to ask God to reveal himself in his love. So, and she kind of had a cool um, equation. She said, well, listen, God says, or Jesus says, all of life is love God and love your neighbor. But you can't love God and love your neighbor unless you first experience love. And I, can't, I haven't experienced it. So she asked every single day, and I, I think it's a great challenge. What if you every day ask God, God, today show me what your love looks like. Show me today. And, and to her surprise, in so many different ways, big and small, things that were already there that she maybe never noticed or really experienced them on behalf of her stood out. And allowed her to enter God's heart of love for her. So, and I and I said, oh my goodness, this is it. We don't. How many how many times do we don't ask? There's something about asking, but by putting yourself in that presence, a God will move through His Holy Spirit. But b it puts you in a position that's actually looking for it. I think a lot of times we're not looking for it. We say we are, and then we then we ignore them the rest of the week. But if we actually say, Lord, today, just show me, seek it. The last day I was with my dad, when he was conscious, what he kept saying over and over again was this. He kept saying, I'm ready. I want to see Jesus. I want to be close to him. And I've been thinking about this recently. You don't just, at the end of your life, get to that moment and say, I want to be with Jesus. He had a life of looking for that. So that was the last thing that he could say at the end of his life. I don't think we magically get to that spot. You're not going to desire God in heaven if you have no desire for God now. If you ask, it's just that little ask is enough to cultivate a, over a lifetime of seeking him so that he could touch your heart and make his love real to you. And he will. Not evenly, not equally. You're not going to have these, you know, technicolor days all days but every once in a while you'll get that sweetness and you'll be able to say I hadn't seen that before thank you Jesus ask for it number one number two turn keep turning away from the things that you thought or that you needed that you don't this is Augustine right you have these loves loves are good but they need to be reordered you have to turn so if you know that control is kind of a thing for you you need to say to yourself what are the places at work that I don't go into? I don't seek to be shalom and care and heal and redeem because it would cost me my control. 
Right? You gotta ask those kind of questions. Where are you not looking for opportunities to love people in the margins of your work? And I say work like your neighborhood, your family, your friends, your vocation, because you would lose comfort if you did that. Where are you only doing what you're doing because you're seeking approval and you're panning it off as benevolence, but really it's about people saying, oh, you're great. Wow, you're such a serving, loving person. How do you handle a boss that doesn't approve of you? How do you handle people who don't approve of you? See, those are the questions. It's, it's all part of turning and, and being cognizant and introspective in those spaces. Each of those questions are asking you to turn from yourself and to people in places that need you in their lives. Ask, turn, and then lastly, go. Abraham doesn't go to Abimelech, not really, right? He was sent to be a blessing, but he kept that blessing away because he wasn't honest, he wasn't giving, because he was afraid God wouldn't go with him. But we know God will go with us because guess what? He already has in Jesus. And that frees us to go in mission. I was at a conference yesterday with a pastor friend named James Robertson, and he had this great analogy. He said the NCAA, sorry for all the people who don't know uh, sports, but the NCAA men's basketball tournament and women's, you have these huge, uh, um, basically, table where you have the first seed playing the 32nd seed. Huge differences in talent. And usually that first game, when it's the number one seed versus like the lowest seed, at the end of the game, that lowest seed is blown out. They're, they lose by 30. But if you go into the locker room, you know what you find in the losing team's locker room? They're, they're calling mom with excitement. They're overjoyed. They're taking selfies. They're excited. You know why? They're just happy to be there. They, they, they think it's amazing that they got there. And they got there because they probably were part of a small conference. And so they were the representative head of that small conference. They got there not even on their own merit. They got there because someone else sent them there. That's very different than, than the first team. The number one uh, seated team is all filled with angst and because guess what they earned it they had to continue to earn it it was all about them the pressure was on they were full of knots and beans and stressing but the low seated teams knew that they were not there on their own they were there because someone else put them there and therefore they were free to just be themselves and play the game for the love of the game and i think it's it's so important for us to realize that's us that we know already how the game's going to end. And it's not up to us to earn it or win it. It's just to, be able to participate in it and do our jobs. And do them for him and for his glory. That means every day you are called to little decisions, hundreds of decisions, in the way that we work. And the question is, is will we do it in a distinct way that heals and doesn't hurt more? So we don't spin things to our client or our bosses. Uh, we tell our kids the truths that they need to hear and don't shy from it because we're afraid of the consequences for us. So if you're an artist or a doctor or a contractor or a bus driver, where in the past have you might not have worked with excellence because that would have been too hard, but now we can with, for, for the joy of just being there, of not having to stress about the outcome. Sometimes, guess what? Your work will be subtle. People won't see it. You'll do things in the shadows that nobody will see, and yet it'll heal and be part of the redemption of all of creation. Small, but real. Other times, it'll be very uh, explicit and seen. What will happen is, is you'll not get drunk at that uh, part, you know, work party. You'll not do whatever, you won't backstab the person who backstabbed, backstabbed you. And people will see it, and they'll say, that's different, that's strange, what's that about? That's what we're called to do, to go. Will we go? Will we know our identity as love to the stars so we're changed to act? If you don't have the first love in your heart, you're not gonna be able to do the second love in the world. That's why every week we say the same thing because the same thing is you've forgotten, you've forgotten, you've forgotten, you're loved, you're loved, you're loved. Look at Jesus, then you'll be sent out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we can in a very simple way, ask today, where are there places that we can be a restorative presence? What aspect of creation are you calling us to heal and fix? 
what person or persons need us in their life. We don't often think that way. I pray that you change us that we do. To be sent to this church, to be sent to this neighborhood, to be sent to this city, to the family and friends. Father, often we're just thinking about our own, we're licking our own wounds, we're trying to suck out our own poisons. We don't have to because we know how it's going to end. You've already brought us into the family. You've already called us sons and daughters. Help us to experience that in new and profound ways. Help us to ask for it. Help us to turn. Help us to, to, to go. And when we do, as we're going, we'll see who we're going with. We'll see you with us every step of the way, through thick and thin, through ups and downs. We t- move our hearts. We pray these things in your name. Amen.